every so often when reading an analysis text, you're going to see a really inspired line. You're trying to show some sort of convergence, so you do the normal thing. You choose an epsilon, which is greater than zero, and then they'll say something like, choose your x prime such that, oh my goodness, the difference between x and x prime is less than epsilon over 3c? Where did they come up with that? And then in the next line, we're going to choose n large enough so that the difference of two other things is less than epsilon over 3? Where did that come from? Well, wherever it came from, at the very end, they want to approximate some difference. And they get that it's less than or equal to something that just magically ends up being less than epsilon. How did they do that? Well, it's of course a lot of experience. Okay, They've already gone through the proof, and they figured out what they need to put into these spots, right? The epsilon over 3c was not so much of an inspired choice as a required choice. In this video, I want to prove a theorem that shows you don't really need to make these sort of inspired choices. Okay, this is an idea that every analyst knows, but when you're first learning calculus, uh, and in particular these sort of proofs in calculus, I think it can become very intimidating or daunting to have to go back and make these sort of inspired choices. So why don't we just prove a theorem that says we don't have to make those sort of choices. So here's the theorem we're talking about. It looks a lot like the uh, definition for sequence convergence. We start with some sequence, uh, we have some L real number, which that's going to be our limit, and we assume that there's a function, remember I call this the eventually function, right, which takes any closeness value, right, this is our domain of closeness, and returns some integer, right, that is the eventually number, right, that's how far out you're going to have to go in the sequence to get always close enough to this L. Okay, the big difference here, okay, is the existence of a positive real number K. This was not in the original definition. Okay, now that's going to come in later, so just ignore it for a moment. Okay, the next bit just copies the definition of sequence convergence, so such that if you have some positive real number, epsilon, and you go out past the eventually number for epsilon, then the difference between the terms in the sequence and the proposed limit L is less than, and this is where the big change comes, instead of saying less than epsilon, we get to do less than some positive number times epsilon. So if we can't show that this difference is less than epsilon, instead, hey, maybe, our, maybe we can show that it's less than like five epsilon, right? Or a million epsilon, okay? It doesn't matter here for the statement of this, what, what K is, as long as it's just some positive real number. And the claim is that if this is true, then A still converges to L. There will be a way to go back and rewrite it so that it's less than epsilon, right? So as long as you can show it's less than some K epsilon, then it will be less than epsilon if you rewrite your proof, right? You have some inspired choices, right? But the beauty of this theorem is it says you don't actually have to come up with an inspired choice. All right, so let's give a proof. The proof is basically going to be one inspired choice. Okay, This one inspired choice will take care of all the inspired choices you would ever have to make. So in order to show that A converges to L, I need to find an eventually function. Okay, fine. So we're going to define a function, and I'm just going to call this um, well, we used n over here, so uh, maybe we'll call it uh, m, right? Just some other letter. So m is going to be a function from the positive reals to the integers, such that, well, actually, I don't need to tell you what the such that is. I need to tell you, you know, what it's going to do. So if I have some positive real number, I need to tell you what integer to send it to. And so here's the cleverness. I'm going to send it to n of epsilon 
over k. So k is this given positive real number from the hypotheses of the theorem. It's positive, so when I divide epsilon by it, I get another positive real number. And so there is some eventually number for epsilon over k. Okay, so I'm, and I'm using the same n from the left. All right. Now, for me to show that a converges to l, I needed to define this function m. And then I need to show that it satisfies these conditions, only there would be no k. So if epsilon is some positive real number and little n is greater than the eventually number, now using m for epsilon, which is equal to n of epsilon over k, then what happens to the difference between the nth term of the sequence and L? Well, because I chose little n past the eventually number for epsilon over k, then I know this is going to be less than, okay, we go back over here to the left. We know that if you go past the eventually number, right, using n, then we're less than k times the epsilon, right? Whatever was the input of our function n. So over here, this will be less than k times the input. Well, the input is epsilon over k. But k times epsilon over k is equal to epsilon. And so I've just shown that if I go past the eventually number using n for epsilon over k, or if you like, the eventually number for epsilon using m, then the difference between my sequence a and my limit l will be less than epsilon. Right? Thus, the sequence a converges to l. And that completes the proof.